day. My new execution time comes without any fanfare but the occasional crack of thunder coming from outside the building. Not that I can see the storm for my cell, of course, with its empty steel walls and security cams and nervous soldiers, so I can only guess at what the sky looks like. It's 6 o'clock a.m. The soldiers remove my shackles and unchain me from my prison wall. It's a tradition. Before a publicized criminal goes off to face the firing squad, Batal the Hall broadcasts footage of them to all the jumbotrons in the square. They unchain you so you have the chance to do something entertaining. I've seen it in the past, and the onlookers in the square love it. Usually something happens. The criminal's resolve starts breaking down, and he begs and pleads with the guards, or tries to cut a deal or an extension, or sometimes even tries to break out. No one ever has. They feed your image live to the square until your execution time comes. Then they cut to the firing squad yard inside Batal Hall, and then they show you marching out to face the executioners. The onlookers in the square will gasp and shriek, sometimes in delight, when the shooting happens. The Republic will be happy they've made an example out of another criminal. They'll play reruns of the footage for several days afterward. I'm free to walk around in my cell, but instead, I just sit there and lean against the wall, my arms resting on my knees. I don't feel like entertaining anyone. My head pounds with excitement and dread, anticipation and worry. My pendant sits in my pocket. I can't stop thinking about John. What will they do with him? June promised to help me. She must have planned something for John, too, I hope. If June is planning to help me escape, she sure is pushing her luck to the limits. The change in my execution date must not have helped her any either. My chest aches at the thought of the danger she's put herself in. I wish I knew what revelations she's had. What could hurt her so badly that she, with all her privileges, would turn against the Republic? And if she was lying? Well... Why would she lie about saving me? Maybe she cares for me. I have to laugh a little at myself. What a thought at a time like this. Maybe I can steal a goodbye kiss from her before I step into the yard. One thing I do know, even if June's plans fail, even if I'm going to be isolated and friendless when I head out to the firing squad, I'm going to fight. They're going to have to fill me with bullets to get me to stay still. I take a shuddering breath. Brave thoughts, but... Am I ready to follow through on them? The soldiers standing in my cell have more weapons than usual, along with gas masks and protective vests. No one dares to take his eyes off me. They really think I'll try to do something cracked. I stare at the security cams and imagine what the square's crowd looks like. You guys must be loving this, I say after a while. The soldiers shift on their feet, a few raise their weapons. Wasting a day in your, of your life watching me sit in a cell? What fun! Silence. Soldiers are too afraid to reply. I imagine the crowd outside. What are they doing? Maybe some of them still pity me, would still be willing to pr protest for me. Maybe a few of them are protesting, although it can't be as serious as last time, or I'd probably hear some of it from the hall. A lot of them must hate me, they must be cheering right now, and still others might just be there out of morbid curiosity. Hours drag by. I find myself looking forward to the execution. At least I'll get to see something other than gray cell walls, if only for a little while. Anything to stop this mind-numbing weight. Besides, if June doesn't succeed with whatever she's planning, I'll get to stop picturing John and my mother and Tess and Eden and everyone in my head. Soldiers rotate in and out of my cell. I know 5 p.m. must be close. The square is probably filled with people by now. Tess. Maybe she's there too afraid to see it happen, and too afraid to miss it. Footsteps out on the hall. Then, a voice I recognize. June's. I lift my head and look toward the door. Is this it? Time for my escape? Or my death? The door swings open. My guards make room as June enters the cell in full uniform, flanked by Commander Jameson and several other soldiers. I suck in my breath at the sight of her. I haven't seen June in such clothes before. Shining, luxurious epaulets draping from her, from each of her shoulders, a thick full-length cape made from some sort of rich velvet, scarlet waistcoat and elaborate belted boots, a standard-issue military cap, simple makeup adorns her face, and her hair is flawless in its high ponytail. This must be standard agent dress code for special events. June stops some distance away from me, and as I struggle to my feet, she looks down at her watch. 
4.45 p.m., she says. She looks back up at me. I try to read her eyes to see if I can guess what her plans are. Any final requests? If you wish a last look at your brother or a last prayer, you'd better let us know now. It's the only privilege you'll get before you die. Of course, final requests. I stare at her and keep my expression carefully blank. What does she want me to say? June's eyes are intense, burning. I, I begin, all eyes are on me. I see June make the subtle movements with her, the most subtle movements with her lips. John, she mouths. I glance at Commander Jameson. I want to see my brother John, I say. One last time, please. The commander gives me an impatient nod and snaps her fingers, then mutters something to the soldier that approaches her. He salutes, then leaves. She looks back at me. Granted. My heart pounds harder. June exchanges the briefest look with me, but before I can focus on her, she turns away to ask Commander Jameson something. Everything is in place, I Paris, the commander replies. Now stop nagging me. We wait in silence for several minutes until I hear footsteps come down the hall again. This time, there's a dragging sound mixed in with the crisp march of soldiers. Must be John. I swallow hard. June doesn't look at me again. And then, John's in the cell, flanked by two guards. He looks thinner and paler than he did before. His long, white blonde hair hangs in dirty strings, and he doesn't seem to even notice that some of it is plastered across his face. Must be what my hair looks like, too. He smiles at the sight of me, although there's little joy in it. I try to smile back. Hey, I say. Hey, he replies. June crosses her arms. Five minutes. Say what you want and be done with it. I nod wordlessly. Commander Jameson glances at June, but makes no motion to leave. Make sure it's exactly five minutes, not a second more. Then she presses a hand to her ear and starts barking out more orders. Her eyes stay fixed on me. For several seconds, John and I just stare at each other. I try to speak, but something lodges in my throat, and my words don't come out. Things shouldn't be like this for John. Maybe for me, but not him. I'm an outcast, a criminal, a fugitive. I've broken the law over and over again. But John's done nothing wrong. He passed his trial fair and square. He's caring, responsible. Nothing like me. You know where Eden is? John finally breaks the silence. Is he alive? I shake my head. I don't know, but I think so. When you stand out there, John continues in a hoarse voice, keep your chin up, all right? Don't let them get to you. I won't. Make them work for it. Punch someone if you have to. John gives me a sad, crooked smile. You're a scary kid, so scare them, okay? All the way till the end. For the first time in a long time, I feel like a little brother. I have to swallow hard to keep my eyes dry. Okay, I whisper. Our time ends all too quickly. We exchange goodbyes and John's two guards grab his arms to lead him all the way out the cell and back into his own. Commander Jameson seems to relax a little, obviously relieved that my request is finished. She motions at the other soldiers. Form up, she says. I, Paris, accompany the guards back to this boy's cell. I'll return shortly. June salutes, then follows John out of the cell, while soldiers approach me and tie my hands behind my back. Commander Jameson disappears out the door. I take a deep breath. I need a miracle now. Several minutes later, they lead me out. I do what John says and keep my chin up. My eyes blink, blank. Now I can hear the crowd. The sound of them rises and falls, a steady tide of human voices. My eyes skim the flat screen panels lining the hall as we pass. The people in the square look restless, shifting like waves on a stormy day, and I pick out the lines of soldiers fencing them in. Now and then... I see people who have a bright scarlet streak painted into their hair. Soldiers are going through the crowd and rounding them up for a rest, but they don't seem to care. At some point, June joins us and falls into step near the back of the soldiers. I glance behind me, but I can't see her face. The seconds drag on. What will happen when we reach the yard? Finally, we arrive at the halls that lead into the firing squad yard. That's when I hear Thomas, the young captain, say, Ms. I. Paris? What is it? June replies. 
Then, words that seize my heart. I doubt she planned for this. Ms. I. Paris, he says. You're under investigation. Follow me. June. My first instinct is to attack Thomas. That's what I would have done if he'd caught me without so many soldiers around. Lunge at him with everything I've got. Knock him unconscious, then reach day and make a run for the exits. I already have John. Somewhere in the halls that lead back to his set old cells lie two guards passed out on the floor. I pointed John to the ven ventilation shaft. He's waiting there for me to make my next move. I free day, shout out a signal. I will free day, shout out a signal. Then John will emerge from the wall like a ghost and escape with us. But I can't win a fight against Thomas and all these guards without the element of surprise. So I decide to do what he, what he says. Investigation? I ask him with a frown. He tips his cap politely, as if an apology, then takes one of my arms and begins leading me away from Day's soldiers. Commander Jameson asked me to detain you, he says. We round the corner and head for the stairwell. Two more soldiers join him. I have a few questions for you. I put on an air of annoyance. Ridiculous. Couldn't the commander pick a less dramatic moment for this nonsense? Thomas doesn't reply. He leads me down the staircase, two flights down, until we enter the basement where execution rooms, electric grids, and storage chambers line the halls. I know why we're down here now. They've discovered the missing electro bomb that I gave to Cade. Normally, inventory check wouldn't have happened until the end of the month, but Thomas must have had it done this morning. I keep the rising panic off my face. Focus, I remind myself angrily. A panicked person is a dead person. Thomas stops us at the bottom of the stairs. He puts a hand on his belt, and I see the gleam of his gun's handle. An electro bomb, bomb's gone missing. The, the dangling lights overhead cast mean shadows across his face. Found it missing in the early morning after I went knocking on your apartment door. You said you were up on the roof last night, right? Do you know anything about this? I keep my eyes locked steadily on his face and cross my arms. You think I did this? I'm not accusing you of anything, June. His expression turns tragic, even pleading, but his hand doesn't move away from his gun. But I thought it was quite a coincidence. Few people have access down here, and everyone else was more or less accounted for last night. More or less accounted for? I say it sarcastically enough to make him blush. That sounds vague. Did I show up on the security cams? Did Commander Jameson put you up to this? Answer the question, June. I glare at him. He winces, but doesn't apologize for his change in tone. This may be it for me. I didn't do it, I say. Thomas looks unconvinced. You didn't do it, he repeats back at me. What else can I tell you? Did they do at least another pass on the inventory check? Are you sure something's missing? Thomas clears his throat. Someone tampered with the security cams down here, so we have no footage, he taps his gun. It was quite a precise job. And when I think of precise, I think of one person. You. My heart starts beating faster. I don't want to do this. Thomas's voice grows softer. But I did find it strange that you spent so much time questioning Day. Do you feel sorry for him now? Did you set something up to... He never gets to finish that sentence. Suddenly, an explosion rocks the entire corridor, throwing us against the wall. Dust rains down from the ceiling and sparks flicker through the air. The Patriots, the Electro Bomb, they've set it off in the square. They came, all, they came all right, right on schedule, right before days to enter the firing squad yard, which means all the guns in this building should be disabled for exactly two minutes. Thank you, Cade. I shove Thomas hard against the wall before he can regain his balance. Then I yank the knife out from his belt reach for the electric grid box and pull it open. Behind me, Thomas reaches for his gun as if in slow motion. Stop her! I take the knife and slice through all the wires on the bottom of the electric grid. A pop, a shower of sparks. The entire basement goes black. I hear Thomas curse. He's discovered his gun is useless. Soldiers stumble over each other. I quickly feel my way to the stairwell. June! Thomas shouts from somewhere behind me. You don't get it. It's for your own good. The words come spilling out of my mouth in a rage. Yeah? Is that what you told Matthias? 
Not much time before backup power kicks in. I don't wait around to hear Thomas's reply. I reach the stairs and jump up three at a time, counting the seconds since the electro bomb went off. Eleven seconds so far. One hundred nine seconds left before guns are functional again. I burst through the first door into a sea of chaos. Soldiers are rushing out to the square, footsteps thundering everywhere. I make my way straight back toward the firing squad yard. Details zip around me like a highway of thoughts. 97 seconds left. 33 soldiers heaving up, heading opposite me, 12 heading in my direction. Some flat screens have gone dark. Must be the power cut. Others show pandemonium in the crowd outside. Something's falling from the sky in the square into the square. Money. The patriots are raining money down from the roofs. Half the crowd's fighting to get out of the square, while the other half scrambling for the notes. 782 seconds. I reach the firing squad hall and take in the scene in an instant. Three unconscious soldiers, John and Day, with a blindfold loose around his neck, which the guards must have put over his eyes right before the bomb went off, are fighting with a fourth. The others must have been called to help contain the square, but they won't be long now. They'll come back in no time. I run up behind them and kick the soldier's feet out from under him. He tumbles to the ground. Sol uh, John punches him in the jaw. The soldiers go soldier goes limp. 60 seconds. Day looks unsteady, as if he might pass out. A soldier must have hit him across the head, or maybe his leg is just giving him trouble. John and I support in between us. I guide us into a narrow hall branching away from the firing squad corridors, and we start making our way toward the exits. Commander Jameson's voice blares out from the intercoms a second later. She sounds furious. Execute him! Kill him now! Make sure the square broadcasts it! Damn it, Day says under his breath. His head sways to one side. His bright blue eyes look dull and unfocused. I exchange a look with John and keep going. Soldiers will be on their way now, back to drag Day out into the yard. 27 seconds. We're a good 250 feet from the exits. We're covering about 5 feet a second. 27 times 5 equals 135. In 135 feet, guns will be reactivated. I can, hard, I can already hear the soldiers' boots in the corridors adjacent to ours, pounding on the door, probably searching for us. We'll need at least 23 more seconds to get to the door before they catch us in this hall. They'll shoot us dead long before we can get out. I hate my calculations. John glances at me. We're not going to make it. Between us, day has faded into a semi-conscious state. If the brothers continue on and I run back to fight the soldiers, I'll probably only take down a few before they overwhelm me. They'll still reach John and day. John stops walking, and I feel day's weight shift over to me. What? I begin to say, until I see John pull the blindfold off of Day's neck. Then he turns around. My eyes widen. I know what he's going to do. No, stay, stay with us. You need more time, John says. They want an execution? They'll get one. He starts running away from us, back down the hall, back toward the firing squad yard. No, 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 John, where are you going? I waste a second looking back at him, torn in that instant, wondering if I should chase after him. John's going to do it. Then, Day's head lulls against my shoulders. Six seconds. I have no choice. Even as I hear the shouts of soldiers behind us in the hall leading to the firing squad, I force myself to turn around and keep going. Zero seconds. Guns are reactivated. We keep going. More seconds pass. I hear a commotion in the halls somewhere behind us. I tell myself not to look back. Then we reach the exits, burst out into the street, and a pair of soldiers is upon us. I have no more strength to fight, but I try. Then someone's wrestling with me, and the soldiers go down, and Cade runs past my line of vision. They're here, she shouts. Move out! They were lurking near the back exits, just like we agreed. The Patriots came for us. I want to tell them to wait for John, but I know it's no use. They grab us and lead us toward their motorcycles. I take the gun out from my belt and fling it to the ground. I can't have its tracker follow me now. Day goes on one motorcycle. I go on another. Wait for John, I want to say. But then we're off. Patala Hall moves away from us. Day a crack of lightning, an explosion of thunder, 
at the sound of pounding rain. Somewhere far away, the wailing of flood sirens. I opened my eyes, then squinted the water falling into them. For an instant, I can't remember anything. Not even my name. Where am I? What happened? I'm sitting right next to a chimney, soaking wet. I'm on the rooftop of a high-rise tower. Ra rain blankets the world around me, and wind whistles through my drenched shirt, threatening to lift me off my feet. I huddle against the chimney. When I look up at the sky, I see an endless field of churning clouds, jet black and furious, illuminated by lightning. Suddenly I remember. The firing squad. The hallway. The flat screens. John. The explosion. Soldiers everywhere. June. I should be dead right now. Filled with bullets. You're awake. Slouched next to me, almost invisible against the night in a black outfit, is June. She's sitting awkwardly against the wall of the chimney, oblivious to the rain that runs down her face. A shift to turn toward her. A spasm of pain shoots up my injured leg. Words stick to my tongue and refuse to come out. We're in Valencia, on the outskirts. The Patriots took us as far as they were willing. They moved on to Vegas. June blinks water from her eyes. You're free. Get out of California while you can. They'll keep hunting for us. I open and close my mouth. Am I dreaming? I scoot close to her. One of my hands comes to touch her face. What? What happened? Are, are you all right? How did you get me out of Batala Hall? Do they know you helped me? June just stares at me, as if trying to decide whether or not to answer my questions. Finally, she glances over at the edge of the roof. See for yourself. I struggle to my feet. Now I can look over the roof at the jumbotrons lining the walls. I limp to the edge of the rooftop and stare down from the railing. We're definitely in the outskirts. I can tell now that the building we're perched on is abandoned and boarded up, and only two jumbotrons along the entire block are functional. I look at the screens. The headline playing on them takes my breath away. Daniel Alton Wing executed today by firing squad. A video recap plays the headline. Plays behind the headline. I can see the footage of me sitting in my cell. I look at the camera. Then, the video cuts to the yard where a firing squad lines up. Several soldiers drag a struggling boy out into the center of the yard. I remember none of this. The boy's blindfolded, with hands cuffed tightly behind him. He looks just like me. Except for a few details that only I would notice. His shoulders are slightly broader than mine, he walks with what looks like a fake limp, and his mouth looks more like my father's than my mother's. I squint through the rain. It can't be. The boy stops in the center of the yard. His guards turn away and hurry back the way they came. A line of soldiers hoist their guns, then point them at the boy. There's a brief, horrible silence, and then smoke and sparks pour from the guns, I see the boy convulse with each shot. He collapses face down in the dirt. A few more shots ring out. Then the silence returns. The firing squad quickly files out. Two soldiers pick up the boy's body and take him away to the cremation chambers. My hands start to shake. The boy is John. I whirl to face June. She watches me quietly. That's John! I shout over the rain. The boy is John! What was he doing out there, out in the yard? June says nothing. I can't catch my breath. I understand what she did now. You didn't take him back, I managed to say. You switched us instead. I didn't do it, she replies. He did. I limp back to her. I grab her by the shoulders and push her back against the chimney. Tell me what happened. What did he do? Why, why did he do it? I shout. It should have been me. June cries out in pain, and I realize that she's injured. A deep gash runs across her shoulder, strain, staining her shirt with blood. What am I doing yelling at her? I tear a strip of cloth from the bottom of my shirt and try to wrap her wound the way Tess would. I put the cloth pull the cloth tight and tie it off. June winces. It's not that bad, she lies. A bullet scraped me. Are you hurt anywhere else? I run my hands down her other arm then gently touch her waist with her and her legs. She's shivering. I don't think so, she replies. I'm okay. 
When I push wet strands of her hair behind her ears, she looks up at me. Day, it didn't go according to my plan. I wanted to get both of you out. I could have done it, but... The image of John's lifeless body displayed on the jumbotron makes me lightheaded. I take a deep breath. What happened? There wasn't enough time, she pauses. So John turned back. He bought us time, and he went back to the hall. They thought he was you. He even wore your blindfold. They grabbed him and took him back to the firing squad yard. She shakes her head again. But the Republic must know by now that they made a mistake. You have to run, Day, while you can. Tears stream down my cheeks. I don't care. I kneel in front of June and clutch my head in both hands, then sink to the floor. Nothing makes sense anymore. My brother was probably worrying about me while I moped in my cell like a selfish brat. John put me first, always. He shouldn't have done it, I whisper. I don't deserve it. June's hand rests against my head. I knew what, he knew what he was doing, Day. Tears appear in her eyes, too. Someone needs to save Aiden, Eden. So, John saved you, as any brother would. Her eyes burn into mine. We stay here, unmoving, frozen in the rain. Feels like an eternity. I remember the night that set all of this in motion. The night I saw the soldiers mark my mother's door. If I hadn't gone to that hospital, if I hadn't crossed paths with June's brother, if I'd found a plague cure somewhere else, would things be different? Would my mother and John still be alive? Would Eden be safe? I don't know. I'm too afraid to dwell on the thought. You threw everything away. I bring a hand up to touch her face, to wipe rain from her eyelashes. Your entire life. Your beliefs. Why would you do that for me? June has never looked more beautiful than she does now, unadorned and honest, vulnerable, yet invincible. When lightning streaks over the sky, her dark eyes shine like gold. Because you were right, she whispers, about all of it. When I pull her into an embrace, she wipes a tear from my cheek and kisses me. Then she buries her head against my shoulder, and I let myself cry. June. Three days later, Barstow, California, 2340 hours, 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Hurricane Avonia has finally started to calm down, but the rain, heavy and cold, continues to fall in sheets. The sky churns in fury. Under all this, Barstow's lone jumbotron broadcasts the news coming in from Los Angeles. Evacuations mandated for Zine, Griffith, Winter, Forest. All Los Angeles civilians required to seek shelter at five stories or higher. Quarantine lifted on lake and winter sectors. Republic wins decisive victory against colonies in Madison, Dakota. Los Angeles declares official hunt for Patriot rebels. Daniel Alton Wing executed December 26 by firing squad. Of course, the Republic would announce Day's execution as successful, even though Day and I know otherwise. Already the whispers have started in the streets and dark alleys, rumors that Day has cheated death once again, and that a young Republic soldier helped him do it. The whispers stay whispers because no one wants to draw the Republic's attention. And yet, they continue to talk. Barstow, quieter than inner Los Angeles, is still overcrowded with people. But the police here aren't looking for us in the way police back in the metropolis must be. Railroad City... Ramshackle buildings. Good place for Day and me to take shelter. I wish Ollie could have come with us too, if only Commander Jameson hadn't pushed the execution up a day. I'd wanted to let him out of the apartment, hide him in an alley, then go back for him. But it's too late now. What will they do to him? The thought of Ollie barking at soldiers, breaking into my apartment, scared and alone, brings a lump to my throat. He's the only piece of Matthias I have left now. Now, Day and I struggle through the rain back to the rail yard where we're getting to set up, going to set up camp. I'm careful to stay in the shadows, even on this stormy night. Day keeps a cap on and tilted low over his eyes. I've tucked my hair inside my, the collar of my shirt and wrapped an old scarf, now soggy, across the lower half of my face. It's about all we can do to disgu for disguises right now, 
Old railway cars litter the junkyard, faded and rusted with age. Twenty-six of them, if you count a caboose missing half of one side, all Union Pacific. I have to lean into the wind to keep from falling over. The rain stings my wounded shoulder. Neither of us says a word. When we finally reach an empty car, a 450-square-foot covered hopper car with two sliding doors, one rusted shut, the other halfway open, must be designed for carrying dry bulk freight, safely tucked behind three others at the back of the yard, we climb inside and settle down in a corner. Surprisingly clean. Warm enough. Most important, dry. Day takes off his cap and wrings out his hair. I can tell his leg is hurting. Good to know the flood warnings are still in place. I nod. Should be hard for any patrol to track us in this weather. I pause to watch him. Even now, exhausted and messy and completely soaked, he has an untamed sort of grace about him. What? He stops wringing out his hair. I shrug. You look terrible. This makes Day smile a little, but it disappears as fast as it comes. Guilt takes its place. I fall silent. Can't blame him. As soon as the rain stops, he says, I want to head out toward Vegas. I want to find Tess and make sure she's safe with the Patriots before we move on to the war front to find Eden. I can't just leave her behind. I have to know that she's better off with them than with us. It's as if he's trying to convince me that this is the right thing to do. You don't have to come. Take a different route to the war front and meet us there. We can decide on a rendezvous point. Better just to risk one of us than both. I want to tell Day that it's insane to head for a military city like Vegas, but I don't. All I can picture are Tessa's hunched, narrow shoulders and wide eyes. He's already lost his mother, his brother. He can't lose Tess, too. You should go find her, I say. You don't have to talk me into it. But I'm coming with you. Day scowls. No, you're not. You need backup. Be reasonable. If something happens to you along the way... How will I know you're in trouble? Day looks at me. Even in this darkness, I can't take my eyes off him. The rain has washed his face clean. The scarlet stripe of blood in his hair is gone. Only a few bruises remain. He looks like an angel, if a broken one. I look away, embarrassed. I just don't want you to go alone. Day sighs. All right, we'll go to the war front, and we'll find out where Eden is, and then cross the border. The colonies will probably welcome us, maybe even help us. The colonies. Not long ago, they'd seem like the greatest enemy in the world. Okay. Day leans toward me. He reaches up to touch my face. I can tell it still hurts him to use his fingers, and his nails are dark with dried blood. You're brilliant, he says. But you're a fool to stay with someone like me. I close my eyes at the touch of his hand. Then we're both fools. Day pulls me close to him. He kisses me before I can say more. His mouth feels warm and soft, and when he kisses me harder, I wrap my arm around his neck and kiss him back. In this moment, I don't care about the pain in my shoulder. I don't care if soldiers find us in this railway car and drag us away. I don't want to be anywhere else. I just want to be here, safe against Day's body, wrapped in his tight embrace, it's strange, I say to Day later, as we both curl up on the floor. Outside, the hurricane rages on. In a few hours, we'll need to head out. It's strange being here with you. I hardly know you, but sometimes it feels like we're the same person born in two different worlds. He stays quiet for a moment, one hand absently playing with my hair. I wonder what we would have been like if I'd been born into a life more like yours. And you had been born into mine. Would we be just like we are now? Would I be like one of the Republic's top soldiers? And would you be a famous criminal? I lift my head off his shoulder and look at him. I never did ask you about your street name. Why day? Each day means a new 24 hours. Each day means everything's possible again. You live in the moment. You die in the moment. You take it all one day at a time. He looks toward the railway car's op open door where streaks of dark water blanket the world. You try to walk in the light. I close my eyes and think of Matthias, of all my favorite memories, and even the ones I'd rather forget, 
and I picture him bathed in light. In my mind, I turn to him and give him a final farewell. Someday, I'll see him again, and we'll tell our stories to each other. But for now, I lock him safely away, in a place where I can draw on his strength. When I open my eyes, Day is watching me. He doesn't know what I'm thinking, but I know he recognizes the emotion on my face. We lie there together, watching the lightning and listening to the thunder, and waiting for the beginning of a rainy dawn. And that is the end of Legend. Boy, that was an awesome book. I really enjoyed that. I'd never read that book before. It came highly recommended to me, and so I thought I would check it out. And man, it was worth it. That was a really good book. I have no idea what I'm doing next or even when that will be. But if it's something you want to hear, uh, let me know. Drop me a message in the comments, and I will uh, certainly consider it. I'm always open to new ideas. But thank you all for listening. Thanks for your comments and, uh, and your likes and all that. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.